Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. Uh, where's here? I just heard you, like every other VC and crypto maniac on the planet, have decamped in Miami. What was what was the reasoning there? Had enough of the New York winters or what? That, that's exactly right. So uh, was down here in Miami for my uh, wife's maternity leave uh, after we had our first son and um, just sort of, it was during COVID and just sort of loved it, loved not having snow or, or winter and figured we'd be outside a lot more with a, with a new kid. And so just decided to explore moving down to Miami and just pulled the trigger. I was very surprised we actually pulled it off, but um, yeah, ended up down here and loving it. Cool. Well, um, as we chatted about before the podcast started, I'll be down there. And so hopefully we can uh, meet up in person one of these days. Uh, the ETF conference listeners has uh, now been moved to April. So if you want to go and say hi, uh, I'll be there. If you're an advisor, you want a free ticket, hit me up. We, I think we got some extras. Anyway, um, so you're originally Ukrainian, right? I was born in Ukraine. I was born in a city called Chernovtsi. Which is, uh, which is the same city that Mila Kunis was born in. Oh, beauty. Um, how are you, uh, what's the vibe, man? You still got family there? Is, uh, this, is this a kind of a tense time, huh? It is a tense time. So uh, not a lot of family there. My, my wife's family lives in uh, Ternopil, which is another city in the West. But basically Ukraine sort of is split down the middle, which is where Kiev is. So if you're in the Western part, um, you're sort of um, a little more ethnic Ukrainian and probably speak Ukrainian. Um, if you're in the eastern part, you're probably a little bit more ethnically Russian or um, maybe um, have um, are, are aligned with more of the, the Russian way of thinking about things. So uh, in the West, um, I don't think they're they're worried about any sort of um, invasion or, or takeover. I think the eastern provinces are the ones at, at real risk uh, where where all the the problems and the drama is. You got you, you still uh, do you have some uh, employees like in, in part of the business based out of Ukraine? Yeah, so we have a large, uh, the majority of our employees are based in Ukraine. Uh, when I when I started Koifin, that's kind of the first engineers I hired were in Ukraine. And so we're a remote company. We're remote in the US. Uh, we have some folks in Argentina, uh, but we actually have an office in Ukraine because we have so many people there. Um, and so we have an office where people go into. Um, and, and so, you know, we do have a pretty big presence there. And so our employees have been a little bit... Um, nervous and anxious and, and yeah. kind of like uh, seeing what's going on. So what hopefully. Western side they're they're all they're uh, majority of them are in Kiev. Okay. Yeah. Um, been on my to-do list to visit one day um, as the uh, not the topic of this, of this entire podcast, but as usual, we beautiful, we beautiful bounce city. around. Yeah, yeah. But so as you know, you're, you're uh, before becoming a software entrepreneur, you know, you're an investment guy. If you had to guess, you know, taking your uh, your insights as an investor, what do you, what what's what's your insight as to a potential outcome here? Do you have any uh, sort of happy hour, sort of over a coffee estimation on how this resolves itself? We're recording this, by the way, listeners, beginning of February. So by the time this publishes, we'll see if Rob is uh, is right or wrong. But what what do you think the actual outcome is here? Oh man, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I I don't have an educated guess. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like scratching my head like everyone else and being like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't seem like there's an end game or any sort of, sort of strategy or plan by Putin, uh, just sort of flexing his muscle, trying to stay in power and just showing that he's the victim. I do think that at some point um, they will probably take some other regions, uh, just like they did with Crimea. Um, so probably some, um, some of the uh, regions bordering Russia, um, maybe some of the regions bordering the Black Sea. Um, uh, there's, there's a, a country called Moldova on the Western side, which is, which is kind of Russian controlled. So there may be some areas there, which they sort of take over. Um, so I, th I, I think that's when I, that's, what's going to happen eventually. Um, and I think there will be some kind of, um, um, agreement signed or understanding signed, um, that'll, that'll sort of keep the peace. Um, you know, I, I do think this kind of the, uh, I do think Russia is, is, has this, um, fear of NATO um, and uh, that that you know that they as a kind of superpower want to be superpower. Um, they um, they're a little bit 
uneasy about NATO sort of encroaching and expanding, uh, and they're obviously not in, not in NATO. And so their alignment with China, I think, um, makes sense in pushing back on this NATO presence. And so unfortunately, Ukraine is caught in the middle. Um, and I, I, I really hope that it's going to uh, sort itself out and, and peacefully in some way. Fingers crossed. All Fingers right. Crossed. So, um, you know, you were a you were a Goldman City guy in a previous lifetime back before they were the vampire squid. Darth <laughs> Vader. I don't know uh, who the who the or the hero, depending on your perspective. Um, and in the hedge fund world, what was your focus? Were you a were you a fundy guy? Were you a macro guy? Uh, real estate? What were you doing? Yeah, so I started uh, I started on Wall Street covering REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts. So uh, at the time, it was the smallest subsector in the S&P 500. Uh, this was 2002. Um, and uh, kind of doing sell side stuff, building models, uh, speaking to, to management, uh, writing research reports. Uh, so it gave me a really nice uh, entry into Wall Street and kind of how to look at companies. Um, and then about a year after I started, uh, my uh, manager, my boss at the time, David Costin, was trend, uh, was moved into a group called Portfolio Strategy to uh, replace Abby Joseph Cohen, who was the strategist at the time. Basically, they wanted him to do just a lot more bottom-up analysis. Abby was just sort of macro market call. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I transitioned to Portfolio Strategy in Goldman Sachs Research and then started focusing on the entire market. So we were looking at every single company, every single sector, a lot of uh, global trends, um, and really trying to um, analyze the data, analyze uh, the trends that are going on with valuation, with fundamentals, with different uh, top-down and bottom-up themes, um, and make sense of it all and sort of tell our clients at the time um, what to do with their money, how to, uh, what sectors to overweight, what sectors to underweight, um, stuff like that. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, he's, he's, he's now the head equity uh, strategist, right? He, so he, so he was the, the, the equity strategist uh, when he transitioned in 2003. Uh, Abby was there for a number of years being the Portfolios. I forget the exact titles they had. They were doing slightly different things. And then at a certain point, Abby moved to, um, I think she's in wealth management now um, or, or some part of Goldman. And so he remains the, the uh, whatever his title was, but Abby's not there anymore. So he's the chief US yeah, strategist. He puts out, he puts out some uh, great work. Um, you know, REITs, REITs must have been an interesting time there because, you know, they've been around for a long time, but particularly I feel like after the internet bubble burst, REITs had a, a big moment because there were certain asset classes that kind of sailed through that 2000, 2003, not so much in the financial crisis, but um, in that early 2000s period, um, they really started to get a bunch of tailwinds. Was, was that accurate? Yeah, that's so, you know, REITs kind of interesting. They have their own designation, uh, uh, which means that they have a special uh, tax structure. Um, and that uh, investors, <coughs> investor, they don't have to kind of pay dividend, sorry, pay taxes because their investors pay taxes. But the caveat is they have to uh, pass uh, more than 90% of their income out as, as dividend. Um, and <clears throat> what's interesting about um, our group at Goldman and the reason kind of David was promoted to, to uh, portfolio strategist, which is a, a much kind of more um, a role with much higher visibility is he looked at the the real estate sector from a from a corporate perspective. So he looked at return on equity and return on cash and capex and how they're allocating money and their growth rate. Um, and all these um, uh, all these companies were were doing it very capital effectively, capital efficiently, and and generating a very high return on capital at a time in 2001, 2000, uh, 2000 2001, 2002. Uh, when you had all these kind of tech stocks that were uh, falling off of a, of a uh, you know, very high valuations. Um, and so at that time, the sector started getting more and more exposure and more mutual funds and, and pension funds started paying attention to the sector. Um, and uh, I think David did a really good job of putting the context of how a REIT makes money versus other sectors. And that's kind of like why people noticed him internally and why people externally recommended him to be a uh, portfolio strategist. But REIT started, uh, it was like EOP and EQR uh, and maybe, um, you know, one other name, I forget, maybe GGP or Boston Properties were in the S&P. And then over the years, more and more um, were, were added to the S&P 500. As the sector grew, as more capital got allocated, as, as these companies were acquiring more properties, 
um, around the country. And I, I don't know what the sector is now. It might, might be, uh, well, it's a sector now, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a gig sector, but at the time it was just a subsector. Um, I remember da uh, David famously, uh, we had a morning call at Goldman and, and the analysts would go on and talk to the sales force and pitch them kind of the research that they just put out. Uh, and all these tech people would go on and be like, you know, um, Sienna is going to go up 100x and uh, CMGI. And, and he would always get up and be like, and now for a company that actually makes money, let me tell you about whatever. Um, and so that was, um, and so he always had a really interesting style of delivering things. Um, and um, my, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the most memorable things I did there was introduce a report called the hedge fund trend monitor. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, uh, I stumbled on this data one day in fact set. I was playing around with it. I was like, holy crap, like do hedge funds like report their holdings? Uh, and then we were like, this doesn't seem right. Hedge funds are secretive. Uh, and then we started looking at the data and, and discovered 13 apps. And um, David's like, uh, put it together, see what you come up with. And I started like aggregating stuff. And we started thinking about how to uh, think about most concentrated names, how to think about different sector exposures, uh, how to think about where things are changing. And, and that was a, a really, uh, really popular report that I think still has a lot of traction in the, uh, in the investment community. Yeah, well, unknowingly, I've certainly referenced you over the years. We ended up writing a book on 13F investing, and um, I remember that report being uh, being a particularly insightful one. And um, so, uh, all comes full circle there. Um, you know, I've always, REITs. Is, it's funny because I, I always wish that REITs, farmland, is a pet topic we talk a lot about in this podcast. That's hard hard as hell to invest in for most folks. And uh, there's like one, maybe two farmland REITs at this point. I've always said, I'm surprised more uh, farming conglomerates or funds don't try to roll out a REIT structure, but uh, who knows, maybe maybe one day. And in a different job, that would be my career choice, but too much work for me at this point. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> you know, um, just a... Uh... A lot of um, a lot of benefits there on the on the tax side. A lot of benefits on the cash flow side and the leverage side. Um, so they're just able to to have very high return on equity because of the the high leverage and the steady cash flow. So just a um, it's like I, I remember doing the analysis in when we started looking at sector allocations and looking at the analysis of the best performing sector. This was in two thousand three or two thousand four. I was like, it has to be tech. Tech grows fast. Tech is high, high earner. And it was Staples. Staples was the best performing sector for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And when we looked at it, I was like, this isn't right. Staples are boring companies. They only grow earnings 4%. And um, at the end of the day, uh, as long as you're steadily compounding your earnings, that's what matters and not kind of like uh, having these, these, these huge cycles. Um, I'm sure tech at some point over the past couple of years has, has surpassed Staples because of the run. But at that point, it was Staples. Well, we did a um, we did a research piece um, or a webinar. I was trying to dig it out while we were talking uh, on REITs, where we were showing that REITs, I forget the exact time frame, but it might have been the last twenty years, uh, was the best performing asset class uh, across the board, which um, I think would surprise a lot of people. But but even going back to the nineteen twenties, we talk about this uh, of the thirty or so French Fama industries. If you look at top one and two, it's one is tobacco and two is beer. So say what say what you may about boring, but uh, but you know the cash cows. Anytime you uh, you sell to human desires, it tends up being a, a pretty good um, pretty good uh, uh, market. Um, so okay, so you were in this financial world uh, in New York, crushing it. Hopped over to some asset <laughs> management, hedge funds. What, what's the time horizon here? Is this around a financial crisis or what? Uh, so uh, so Goldman Research, I went to work on the um, on the prop trading desk in London for a little bit. This was 2008, not great timing. Uh, this was in London. Then went to a macro fund called Caxton. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the so world, world famous shop. A world famous shop. Um, so was there uh, for a little bit, got some exposure to macro and how macro investors trade. Um, then went to uh, City Equity Trading Strategy to be on the trading desk, looking at um, looking at trade ideas, thematic trade ideas, and how to express them in options and, and baskets and ETFs. Uh, so that was a, a pretty interesting job. We had an internal uh, book that we were running, and we were pitching clients' ideas. So that was a, a little bit of best of both worlds. 
Um, and then went to Lixor Asset Management, which, which is SoftGen, uh, to work in their a macro team. Uh, and then lastly, worked at Techni Capital, which is a long short uh, hedge fund that was spun out of Duquesne. Um, and so uh, there I was kind of helping the PM with everything uh, from risk to options trading to, to all this other stuff. So as you can tell, I, I can't hold the job down for very long, uh, not very employable. What was the uh, what was the what was the decision there? What was the origin story for uh, wanting to strike out on your own? You know, I, I did not want to strike out on my own in terms of starting this company. Other than um, after Techni, I started looking for uh, my next role um, and decided to start investing on my own for a little bit and seeing kind of how I do in the market. Um, and with that, wanted to uh, get some tools to analyze the market to sort of understand what's going on and. I'd used Bloomberg and FactSet and CapIQ and, and everything under the sun in my previous jobs. Um, but now that I was kind of paying for it myself, I wanted to find <laughs> some other resources, right? So um, I went out and, and I was like, you know, I know Interactive Brokers has so much data. I'm sure they have a bunch of tools that would be great for me. And it was just like the same kind of <clears throat> very difficult to use interface as I had seen 10 years before. Um, and I don't know. I don't know how someone doesn't buy interactive brokers. Maybe you can buy them and then, um, or LBO them and just slap like a pretty front end on them. And you have like the best possible brokerage out there. They, ha they have such a, uh, confounding customer service sort of front end offering. Maybe, I don't know. It's just, it, you know, I, I think they know what they're good at and they're good at price and access. Um, and, um, that's, that's what they, what, that's what they compete on. But, um, you know, um, that's, that, that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad way to think about what we're trying to do is sort of take the ac access and accessibility and the coverage of interactive brokers, uh, and think about it more from a research and, and analytics perspective. Jeez, um, they're a $30 billion shop. That's their market cap. My God. And they're pretty big. So much for LBOing them. I, uh, that's <laughs> gonna could, be a little you, harder than I was. You, you can LBO that. They should just buy Robinhood. There you go. Perfectly. Interactive Brokers buys Robinhood. There's their pretty front end. All right. You, uh, can you can you imagine trading all the instruments on Interactive Brokers on your app with no Y scale? Uh, um, through yeah. The yeah. Exactly. Well, the Interactive Brokers. I mean, if you if all these uh, meme stop and crypto people start to learn about futures and, and <laughs> spot Forex. There you go. That's the real juice. Okay. So wait, what was your style at this point? You know, you'd kind of bounce around a number of different places. Were you, uh, you know, medium term equity person? Were you trading currency pairs? What were you, what were you doing? And, and what, and what was the, uh, was it, was it fundy macro what? Yeah. So, um, uh, a little bit of a mutt. So a little bit kind of like borrowing from all these different styles that, that I learned. So, um, liked looking at stocks and just looking at um, companies, um, liked looking at options as well um, and, and thinking about like, what is the vol market saying and can this be expressed in options more efficiently or gain better leverage? Um, I liked looking at macro and thinking about like, what are the top down views or top down themes to think about in terms of either the Fed cycle or thematic trends. Um, and I like looking at technical analysis and, and really um, thinking about is the market confirming my views or is it saying something maybe about the macro that I'm not thinking about. Um, so just a little bit of, of everything um, and then just trying to think what is the best way to implement something to implement an idea so um, you know you could have a, a macro idea or a thematic idea and there's just um, uh, a number of ways to do it um, and sometimes it has to do with liquidity sometimes it just has to do with you know, this is the most direct way or has has less, uh, fewer other factors that are impacting it. So um, my my trading style at the time was probably, uh, you know, 40% um, uh, single stock, 40% ETFs and 20% other. Other meaning what? Like what, what like, was it, what it just special situations? Uh, uh, sorry, futures, futures, oh, yeah. uh, futures, options, currencies. Uh, so yeah. that's, yeah, so special situations, I don't, uh, never, never was good at that. Um, you know, playing, play, playing like an ARB spread or anything like that. Uh, but just kind of like more macro instruments. I'd say with, um, you know, with with like currencies. Um, there's just uh, the way I think about currencies is just you get massive leverage. That's kind of the beauty of it. Um, typically, when when there's a trade to be had in currencies, there's probably a trade to be had in in, in indices or, or equities or ETFs. 
Um, so I can't think of, um, you know, I can't think of maybe if you're playing like the Turkish lira and, and kind of like what, um, what they're doing there, that's probably a direct currency trade and, and more, uh, more dirty to play it in, in, in equities. Uh, but typically the themes that I'm thinking about in terms of where the Fed is or which themes are working, um, th that's typically more, uh, more directly expressed in, in equities or ETFs or, or indices. All right. So you were saying, all right, kind of like Meb, open-minded, I'll use whatever works uh, across whatever discipline. Um, also like Meb, I'm a cheap bastard. I'm not going to go pay for Bloomberg out of my pocket. Um, I joke on this podcast that in the very, very early days of my career, um, my, uh, my method for getting access to all these uh, various data sources was through friends who had uh, we're at graduate school at Stanford, so they had the logins for all the all the various databases, mm -hmm. which they so generously shared. Thank you, uh, <laughs> GSB. Um, but uh, so you said, okay, I'm looking around, I'm trying to find a good good solution. Uh, most people would stop there and just either fork up for one of these or cobble them together. What was what was kind of the the next uh, iteration for you? So, you know, I, um, it was the first time that I got a chance to really explore what's out there um, and really um, start, start using the products and trying to use the products for my workflow. Yeah. Um, and so the, the products that were meant for individuals just didn't have the, the capability to do what I wanted to do. Um, they didn't have the data or they didn't have the actual functionality. And then on the, on the professional side, not only was the cost very, very high, so that's kind of like one variable, but they were just very unpleasant to use. They were all very old. Um, most of the, like with Faxit and Cap IQ, the use case is Excel, right? You get that data to put it into Excel. You don't get the data to really, um, to you don't get those platforms to use the platform. Um, on the front end, you get the, the platform for the data. And typically you're doing all the analysis in the, in the, um, in Excel. And, you know, when I started to kind of like put together my resources and thinking about what I need to use, I was just like, this is crazy what's going on in this sector, in this field. You have, you know, this uh, technological revolution, you have these software companies that are um, creating these beautiful uh, products. Uh, you have uh, companies like Tableau that are, that are really uh, revolutionizing how data is visualized. Um, and then in finance, it's just kind of crap. It just looks like it's still from the 1980s and yeah. just started going down this rabbit holes. Why is that the case? Like, why is it that this is a, a sector or a, a, a field where there's just nothing innovative happening and everything's just super old? And, you know, the response I got back was like, look, the data is like super expensive. Like nobody knew could come in because the data is just really expensive. And so I started analyzing and started calling around being like, how much does that, that actually cost? Is it hundreds of millions? Is it tens of millions? Is it hundreds of thousands? Um, and I sort of convinced myself where I was able to find out that the data is expensive. It's not cheap, but that's not, it's, it's not overwhelmingly expensive. And what I wanted to do is available. And there's data out there that, that is available uh, to sort of build a platform that is uh, more intuitive, more functional, um, uh, easier to use than some of the uh, platforms out there. So that's that's kind of like when I started and how I started thinking about this concept of, of Koifin and started uh, kind of refining it and um, decided to bootstrap it um, in, in the beginning. I sort of said, hey, this is something I want to build for myself. Uh, it's something that, um, you know, I'll hire a couple of engineers to help me build. Um, I was very, um, I felt very strongly that I knew what I wanted the product to look like, mm -hmm. having been a, a user. Um, an investor, but I didn't really know how to build a product or, or kind of how to uh, build an engineering team. Um, and so started pretty small uh, with a team in Ukraine. Um, and then once I saw some results, decided to, to um, uh, expand that team. Um, and so slowly but surely, we, we were building the product, um, um, getting feedback, putting it out there. I saw more and more people starting to use it. Um, and then at a certain point, um, there was enough traction. There was kind of um, enough opportunity that I saw in this company that um, I raised uh, some venture capital money um, and uh, started expanding the team and moving a little bit faster. All right. So what, what year would this be in the timeline? 2014? So I launched, Koi, I, I decided, uh, I decided to launch 
Koifin on March uh, 7th, 2016. Okay. Um, so uh, congrats, man. Five years. Uh, well done. You survived the uh, the gauntlet of the most, most startups um, uh, getting to be a toddler. Um, <laughs> when, when you looked around, like what was the main missing piece you know was it um you said look none of these have what i want um Mm -hmm. what was that you know because because i mean i remember going back 20 plus years and using things like trade station using i I can't even remember at this point so many of the various uh, software data programs like what was the killer app or was the interface what what was it that you said look i want this but this isn't out there um at least version one, and then we can kind of walk forward to what you have today. Uh, but but what, what were you looking to build? Yeah, so uh, so the first thing is kind of the, the data coverage, is I wanted something that covers um, a bunch of different assets and looks across asset classes and not just focused on, on one thing. So, um, you know, with like CapIQ, uh, very much focused on, on equities, doesn't have a lot of stuff on, um, on uh, economics or, or macro. Um, with um, um, other platforms, they have other very special, like Morningstar is obviously very, very mutual fund uh, focused. So uh, one is kind of the, the data coverage. I wanted a platform that has a lot of equity data, fundamentals, valuation, uh, but also other asset classes like mutual funds, ETFs, economic data, bonds, currencies. Um, and, and, and so the data coverage and professional grade data coverage was, was important to me. Um, the second thing was was really the analytical tools to turn that data into information. So I didn't want a platform where I had to suck stuff into Excel and do the workflow in Excel. I wanted a platform where I had the functionality in the platform to do what I wanted it to do. Um, you know, my my favorite, personally favorite platform out of all the platforms I've used is Bloomberg. And um, Bloomberg does a lot of bad things about it, including the cost and some UI stuff. But it's actually really powerful, um, and it's really powerful because it 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 just um, has a lot of functionality. It's it's not only does it have just a ton of data, but it has you know thirty thousand functions that that you can use to analyze that data. And uh, Michael Bloomberg was was really early on in some of these kind of concepts that today are um, are are pretty widespread in in terms of like you know data visualization and. He built all the graphing stuff himself and, and able to really visualize and graph um, any sort of data. The, the fact that you can do keyboard shortcuts and access stuff really quickly, um, you know, there's uh, Superhuman is, is a company that sort of popularized this in the email world. Um, and now it's sort of becoming a trend in, in software. But with Bloomberg, these keyboard shortcuts, you, you know, they did it because there were no, there, there was no mouse when they started uh, uh, putting their their platform together, mm-hmm. so this this ability to really get through the data um, through uh, graphing, through dashboards, through snapshots, and having that functionality in the platform that was that was super super important to me. Um, and the last thing is just having a a modern and intuitive user user interface, so something that was easy to use, somewhere where you could click around um, and really felt more like a, a Airbnb than it did like a interactive brokers or a Bloomberg. Um, and that was that was the uh, another thing that was important to me. Um, one of the um, <clears throat> sort of backing up to uh, my my career, um, one of the things that that uh, my first manager David Custom was really good at is presenting data. Is basically taking a bunch of data and then saying, "All right, this is how we should organize it, or this is the thing we should call out." Um, and we'd spent a long time in our reports really thinking about how do you organize, how do you visualize, how do you present data, and that's not something that was really done on Wall Street. Those people were just kind of like throw data on a page and throw kind of just a bunch of numbers and sort of say, here, read it. Um, Whereas he spent a lot of time thinking about how is the data interpreted and, um, you know, started, uh, had me start uh, reading Edward Tufte books um, and thinking about data visualization, stuff like that. So that's something that was ingrained in my mind very early on in my career. Um, And that's something that, that I really appreciate. And that's something that I wanted to, um, uh, to, to show up in the platform uh, as well. Um, how long did it take you to get version one out? I imagine it was not cheap, although you seem to have uh, really been adept at the remote um, sort of sort of team before it was cool. Uh, what, what was the original rollout? Was it sort of a, a friends and family or did you do it where it's actually public facing pretty quick? 
Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the things that I thought about is um, kind of like, what can we innovate on? What can we add um, um, is the business model is kind of how we sell the product. And uh, when I looked around in the tech world and the software world, the best companies, the fastest growing companies were growing because they were freemium. They were kind of giving away a bunch of the product for free and then charging for more advanced functionality. Um, and that's something that I thought was brilliant. Something that I thought was kind of product-led growth that if you have the best product out there, you let people use it, they'll pay you for it. And if, if you're solving a problem for them. So right from the beginning, uh, what we wanted to do was have a freemium model um, and have a substantial portion of our product be available for free. Um, and then charge users for, for more stuff. Um, and so um, the first version was, to answer your question, the first version was probably about 18 months after launch and, and there was kind of like iteration. Um, I found a designer on Craigslist that I was working with mm. um, and and we were kind of like designing it. And, and now when I look back- And to be clear, did you have any software chops yourself? Not so much. Zero, zero software <laughs> chops. And so- um, I, I just kind of like worked with the designer to say, well, the, the first <laughs> the first iteration was me working with these software engineers and then kind of like drawing it on, on pencil and paper and giving it to them. And then when they like the product came out, I was just like, what the hell is this? This is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. They're like, what do you mean? This is like well, how you told us to build. And I'm yeah. like, this is so ugly. Like how like this? And they're like, well, get a designer. I'm like, a designer? What do they do? <laughs> so it's like, so I was like, great, go on Craigslist. Let's find a designer. Um, and so we had a, we, uh, I found a designer, uh, her name was May. And so in, um, uh, on the weekends she was, she had a full-time job, um, and the weekends she was helping me design a, a bunch of the, the, uh, mock-ups and a bunch of the screens. Um, and you know, the, the, uh, like, it's just so funny seeing the, the original designs and what Koifin originally looked like, but it was the skeleton was there that it was single page, page application and focused on charting. There were, you know, things that you could do on the side to impact the charts and, and there was a menu. Um, and the way I thought about it was kind of like from a Bloomberg perspective, um, these are the 50 functions that people use every day. And I want to focus on 10 at first, right? So focused on on graphing and, and movers and, uh, you know, financial analysis and uh, mutual fund description and, and GM, which is the performance graph. So that's kind of how we thought about it. And um, really thought about it from a modular perspective. Like we want to create modules. We don't want to. We don't want anything to kind of like depend on anything else. And that's really important about our product is it's a very flat structure. So it's a very very modular structure, which is really easy to na navigate and uh, and to think about. Um, and yeah, so released. You know, the, released the first version, um, and put it in the wild. Just had a. At first, we didn't even have a website. You would go to Coifin, and it would be the app. Um, and uh, we had a debate internally whether that was good or not and decided to have a, um, a, a landing page to describe what it is because people, some people would go to it and be like, oh my God, what is this? Uh, you know, feels like you're about to steal my information. I don't know what this is. So we had a little gateway of a, with a landing page um, and then just, you know, blasted out to my network, had just very, very, um, had almost no usage. Uh, would, I was I was going around to like investment clubs. I remember when I went to um, Columbia University and pitched it at the investment club there, and we had like eighteen people sign up. Um, and my co-founder like messaged me. He's like, "Oh my god, eighteen people signed up!" And I was like, "That's because I went to and you know like seventeen of them didn't use it the following day." Yeah. Um, and it, it is very iterative, just kind of like thinking about like what are people using it for, why are they using it, and um, I was I was reading a lot of. Um, uh, uh, websites so, uh, uh, at the time on, on product management on how to think about product development. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of interesting to uh, like, it, it's a whole science. It's a whole um, uh, framework uh, to think about like, why do people uh, use things, the jobs to be done framework. Um, if you have something, how do you figure out what's working? Why are people using it? How do you add to that? Do you focus on things people are using or do you focus on things that people aren't using? And do you focus on things that people are requesting and, um, you know, I remember in the beginning, people were just requesting stuff and we were doing everything. And then at a certain point, we're like, wait, what the hell are we even building here? Um, so having a framework to prioritize uh, features and having a framework to define our users uh, was important. And so we made a lot of mistakes, uh, but, uh, but have been, um, you know, have, have fixed them, figured them out and have been, uh, you know, moving forward, which is important. So um, 
let's spend a little time tell, tell us kind of like what are the top three i don't know top five things people use it today so you kind of iterate you become a software founder um you start to figure it out and software is all about sort of you know just just new versions and implementation iterations um where are we at today like what what, what are people mainly using this for top kind of three five take your pick uh uh reasons yeah so <laughs> i'd say um the like if if i abstract our software away or, or kind of like how we're thinking about our users um there's really five things that our users are doing that we want to attack and help them do from a software perspective. And what's so, what's the price point, by the way? Um, so people know. I assume the vast majority are um, sort of professional slash engaged individuals. Yeah. So two. So the majority of our of our users are individuals, um, and then and then the second largest segment is financial advisors, um, and it's individuals who are. Um, who need more advanced tools than Yahoo Finance or, or their brokerage. So it's not like Robinhood people who are like, hey, I wonder what the you know EBITDA margin is of Apple and how it compares to Facebook. So maj the majority of individuals don't know what to do with our software because it is pretty advanced. Um, and so there is a learning curve. Um, the, the, the biggest segment of individuals we have are software engineers. Um, they tend to be kind of have more disposable income. They tend to be a little more quantitative. Um, a lot of for, former Wall Street people are using us as, as individuals, uh, but it's definitely for the more uh, advanced individual user. And to answer your question directly, so the free version, which is uh, the majority of our users, 90% of our users, 95% of our users is free. Um, then we have three tiers. Uh, we have a basic tier, which is $15 a month paid annually. We have the plus tier, which is $35 a month paid annually. And then we have the pro tier which is $70 a month paid annually. And the difference is you get more data, more functionality, more customization as you go up in the, in the tier structure. Um, it seems like the, one of the, is one of the biggest levers, like the ability to export data. Mm -hmm. um, is that like, like of the tiers, is it like just customization or like, are there any, what's the main levers between those? Yeah. So, um, uh, um, so, um, taking all those categories one by one. So on the data side, for example, the mutual fund data is only in our pro tier because we have to pay uh, per, per user for that, for that data. And so we have to sort of put in the higher tier. Uh, we know that kind of financial advisors typically use that data. So they have a little bit more disposable income. Um, uh, so that's one example of something that's just in the pro tier. And we have some very basic functionality in the free tier for mutual fund data, like looking at a, at a chart or just seeing what mutual funds we have. Um, downloading data is in our is in our middle tier. So if you wanted to download a dashboard or download the constituents of an ETF, um, you can do that um, in the in the plus or pro tier. Um, uh, financial data, so the financial data for a stock in the free tier, we only have three years worth of free data. But if you wanted to look at the full uh, five years, that's basic. Twenty years is plus, and then full history is is pro. So that's an example of, of data availability. Um, another thing is the ability to create your own dashboards. So one of the kind of benefits of Coifin is you can create your own watch list and dashboards of different securities, of different graphs, kind of mix and match different uh, ways to, to look at uh, the market. So if you've ever used the Launchpad feature on Bloomberg, which is allowing you to kind of customize how you want to look at the market, that's sort of what the dashboards are, are replicating. Um, and you get two free dashboards in the free version, and uh, you get eight in the basic version, you get unlimited in the plus and, and pro version. Um, another example is transcripts. So company transcripts for company filings are only in the plus version. Uh, we have some premium news sources like Reuters that are only in the, in the basic and, and the version. So just thinking about kind of more advanced workflows, customization, uh, more, uh, more advanced professional data. All right. So I, inter I interrupted you. Sorry. You were uh, going to walk through the main use cases for why people mm. are uh, interacting with it. So let's go. Yeah, so uh, the kind of five buckets we think about are analytics, discovery, tracking, collaboration, and execution. And so that's kind of if you um, abstract away what our users are doing, that sort of falls in those five buckets when it comes to, to investing. So on the analytics side, um, the, uh, the, the most popular feature by far is our graphing, is our ability to graph any sort of time series or any sort of financial data. So obviously stock prices or mutual fund prices or total returns. But then if you think about any financial or any economic data, 
or ETF flows or, or drawdowns or whatever it is, you can graph that on, on Coifin very easily. And so you could just type in a series and add the series and then move the graphs around. Um, and that's that's really powerful. That's differentiated. That's the, the number one feature. Um, the, the second feature is really the dashboards, the dashboards I just mentioned, which is kind of customizing the different modules uh, to how you want to set up your, your platform. So in the dashboards, you can have a watch list and two graphs or three watch lists or four graphs together. So you could sort of mix and match uh, different, different things. Um, and that customization feature is, is super powerful and, and our second uh, most used function. The third most used function are the snapshots. And snapshots are a way for a user to analyze a specific security. So we have a overview snapshot, a description snapshot, a dividend snapshot, an ETF exposure snapshot for companies. Uh, for ETFs, we have a constituents snapshot where you could see the constituents, but also see the contribution of each stock and each sector to that ETF's performance. Uh, we have mutual fund snapshots. Um, we have uh, you know, different snapshots for, for the securities for people to really just get a view of, of that security without having to look up every single item. So that's the, um, that's the third um, most used function. The fourth are market dashboards. So we have a bunch of market dashboards that you can browse um, uh, uh, different parts of the market. So a factors dashboard where you can see how factors are performing, sectors, currencies, indices, uh, global yields, yield curves. Uh, so different ways of slicing and dicing the market. And that's our, um, that's our uh, fourth most used function. And then um, th there's a bunch of functionality that's sort of in the tail end. So we have uh, news that's pretty popular. Uh, we have a scatter plot that's used uh, uh, by a lot of people. We have a function that's one of my favorite functions I created for myself called the lots of charts function, where you put in an ETF or a watch list or an index, and it shows you all the charts in that index or ETF. And so if anyone is looking at technical analysis or trends, that's a really fast way of, of being able to, to see that. So um that's that's sort of yeah we got uh, 13 f's in there or what yeah we you know we don't have 13 f's and that's because uh the data is super hard to license uh none of the providers will give us the 13 f data in the in the kind of like full amount in the sorry in, in the in the full view they'll give us the top 20 or the top 10 um so what i think what we're going to do is really just uh use the sec website and get the data ourselves um, because the data is actually better organized now than it used to be. There's like a more defined way of how 13 Fs have to be filed and how they have to be tagged in each security. And so I think we're going to be getting that data ourselves. But that's been pretty, you know, coming from the person who created the hedge fund trend monitor from 13 Fs. That's what I mean. Come on, if, man. You if, can't yeah. Uh, yeah. come full circle. Um, yeah. The dashboard is great. To me, that is uh, a pretty, pretty nice homepage. You know, it's so many of these apps and websites, you you can get stocks and that's about it. But particularly for the macro people that want to see a number of different things, it's a, it's really well done. Um, when are you guys going to build an app? Is that in the cards for your phone? It is, yeah, it's, it, it's in the cards. It's, you know, we just uh, expanded that team to get that out faster. It's sort of been uh, lingering a little bit longer than, than I wanted. Um, but should be, you know, everything goes right, should be out by April. So it's really- Oh, wow, soon. Soon, yeah. So it's it's kind of interesting. Like, um, you know, our platform is desktop first. Like, you can't do the workflows that we're trying to do on the phone, but the phone is obviously very important in terms of uh, being able to track your portfolio or watch list or news or just right. what's happening in the market. Um, and so we've been really um, thinking about what goes in the app, what's the future of the app, how does it connect to to the overall application. But it's looking good. It's going to be great. It's going to be hopefully out in April. Good. Well, uh, looking forward to that because. Uh... You guys have found a wedge there, I think, on on um, what I was saying with the dashboard. You know, as far as roadmap, you've built this company uh, successful. What's the future look like for you guys? As you look out to 2022 and beyond, um, you know, is it just endless feature requests from users? Uh, do you have some designs on uh, expansion to certain uh, data set silos or features? What's uh, what's what's next for you guys? Yeah, so uh, the future, um, the future for Coifin is really to be the financial operating system for different users, for different investors, and uh, what that means is, 
you know, when I look at our platform, we have everyone from students to hedge fund managers using our platform, which is really strange because they're not the same sort of user persona. They're different user personas. Um, but the reason that they're using our platform is because they have common workflows and they're able to customize the system for their own use cases. And so when I think about kind of the future, I think about that, that power um, and that place that we have of being able to customize the platform for the use case of that particular investor. So our vision in the future is that we're going to be connected to any single, any sort of financial data that's out there. And then having that toolkit that the user can then choose of how they want to look at that financial data, whether it's through portfolio analytics or model portfolios or portfolio optimizations or just graphing or snapshots and being able to mix and match what, how they want to look at the market, what asset classes to look at and how they want to organize. Tell me some highlights and lowlights of this experience, software uh, designer, entrepreneur, working with customers. Um, I imagine you know, we have almost 100, probably over 100,000 investors now. So I could tell stories all day about fun, humorous, uh, sad, insightful feedback we get all the time. But what's it been like on your on your side? Was it just a, a year of um, meme stock requests last year? Anything uh, funny, weird, different uh, that you want to pass along? Yeah, just, you know, so many different users and people. And uh, we have over 300,000 users now. Um, uh, it, awesome. it's just, it, it, thank you. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting how people interact uh, over email, just people are polite and some people are nice and some people are engaging. Other people are just uh, dicks. And I'm sorry, yeah. can I say it? Uh, just, yeah, um, that's, my, that's my first rule of social media and just, well, just being a, a human in the 2020s is DBAD. Don't be a dick. Yeah. So th that's, that rule is constantly violated, but uh, instead you know, of the, instead of the WWJD, what would Jesus right. do if he would just yeah. get the temporary tattoo? What would uh, a DBAD don't be a dick. <laughs> that should be tattooed on, on everyone yeah. when they're, when they're yeah. born. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've gotten our fair share of uh, anti-Semitic uh, responses to my, to my emails, uh, which is super strange. Um, yeah. And, and always uh, a little weird. Yeah. Um we uh, we had uh, we had Barbara Streisand's assistant reach out to us one time and 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 uh, try and basically set up a, a call with with uh, Ms. Streisand that didn't happen because we don't have options data on our platform yet. Uh, so that she's, was, she's a big tr trader. I didn't know she's still uh, cranking so out. Good for I, her. I, I I was I was that was my favorite uh, kind of like help email to see. That was uh, that's I, funny. I, I wish we did have options data. So try to uh, try to convert. You can build it out just for her. Say, hey, you give us uh, the uh, whatever's above the pro feed. It can be the the influ influencer celeb feed. And, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do some custom bespoke work. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I used to watch her in Yentl, and now I see yeah. uh, now she's gonna be a client. Um, so that was that was cool. Um, we, you know, I send out. Um, I did it the first year we were around, but I send out an April Fool's email every year uh, um, and, oh no. and so that's that's been so um the the first year um we send out an email like hey we're rolling we're just like rolling out features we're rolling out a feature that predicts the stock market with with ai and ml and it's 99 percent accurate and uh we're using you know blah 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 and click here to access it um, and click here is, is Wikipedia page to April Fools. Uh -huh. and, so, and so people didn't even click on the link. They're just like replying, how could you do this? There's no way this makes sense. So that's, that's always fun to see. Um, the, uh, the second year we did a- It was like um, probably the highest click-through rate you ever get for a campaign. But, right. that, but it's even funnier that it didn't even get click-through. It's, it's just uh, read the headlines, comment. Re read the headlines. And then uh, last year, uh, sorry, two years ago, we did one uh, get coifin for this is during COVID, so we're just mm -hmm. like, hey, uh, difficult environment out there. Get coifin for life for uh, nine ninety nine, um, and it's just like uh, click here, and it was it was uh, April Fools, um, uh, and, and so a lot of people like found that funny. But then you also have like a lot of people who are pissed off. They're like, how dare you waste my time and help? Yeah, um, so that's that's always interesting to see if who has a sense of humor. And then last year we had a April Fools of um, Coifin is completely pivoting towards crypto. So we had an email with like, <laughs> with like uh, me, me and, and Rich, my co-founder, with laser eyes, and we're like, you know, the stock thing isn't working, or this this traditional stuff isn't working. We're pivoting towards crypto, um, and we had a link. But <laughs> the sad part is the link 
Uh, apparently Wikipedia got hacked. So the Wikipedia April Fool's link directed you to like a porn site. And so people are emailing me like, have you clicked on the link? Did you? And I'm just like, dude, relax. It's like Wikipedia. And they're like, no, click on the link. And I click on, and there's like a, a, a big person, a big, big gentleman with a, um, so it, I was just like, oh my God. So yeah. you, you so, gotta be careful with the crypto crowd. I had posted a tweet years ago from Switzerland with my friend, Jeremy Schwartz, you know, who's a, a head of research at Wizardry yeah. and, and, and um, joking that they were, uh, uh, putting out a Litecoin ETF and um, th- how quickly that whipped around the world and how angry people were. Uh, and Jeremy, who's at a big, you know, corporate <laughs> company, whose whose uh, PR team wasn't amused uh, at at my uh, my joke, um, but uh, but was funny anyway. Uh, it's good to have a sense of humor, uh, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, all right. So you guys, what's the plan? You're just going to stay independent. You're going to keep growing. Uh, what's the future look like on that side of the business? How many folks y'all got now? Uh, so we have, uh, 25 people, uh, 25 employees, uh, kind of looking to do our series A pretty soon. So it's still a pretty young company. Um, you know, for us, like the future, uh, build the best product out there, solve our, our users' needs uh, in, in terms of financially getting acquired, whatever that's going to take care of itself. Uh, we're in a space that just has so much potential and so much opportunity and so much change. Um, and we have this really interesting positioning of, of having the best product and analytics out there that people love and rave about. Um, and so we're just going to be building functionality, solving our users' needs. And um, I think the, the the outcome will take care of itself. Most memorable investment, your career uh, has spanned both starting a company and being in a number of funds and big investment shops, most memorable, good, bad, in between investment. Oh man. Um, I think, I think the investment I remember the most is CMGI in the nineties. Oh if you God, you just, caused me, you just caused me sweaty palms. That's, so, that's a, you just so, triggered me. <laughs> so I, 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 yeah, it's just like when I was first started, started learning about stocks and, you know, CMG, what, what was, it was called the incubator. It's an incubator. Uh, and you know, went from like 20 to 2000 to like one, uh, to zero. And uh, so I bought it at some point before 2000 and obviously sold it at a, at a huge loss, but uh, that was fun. That's, you know, it was kind of like my, my, one of my first experiences trading and uh, investing. Well, you, you weren't the only person. I mean, everyone owned it. I owned it. Um, uh, you know, man, there's so many things about this one. They, they had named the uh, Patriots field with CMGI yep. field. So yep. um, as my local, Lakers facility is now called crypto.com. There's, <laughs> there's a bunch of research that shows if you're a public company that name a stadium, the stocks are just an absolute dumpster fire. It's like the worst sentiment indicator. But uh, yeah, it was like a um, uh, almost like a VC portfolio roll up all into one. Alta Vista was a portfolio company. Th- there and- were a couple of legitimate ones in there, but like you know, like a hundred of them and probably two got acquired and had a real product. The others were just kind of uh, market cap to clicks, right? That was the uh, that was the valuation measure. Yeah, I, I have to look at the eventual post-mortem. I know, it, I mean, it was like 10, 20, 30 billion dollar company, um, mm-hmm. but curious to where, uh, where that, what the final gravestone was, tombstone. Um, where do people go? They want to find out what you're up to, what's going on in your world. Uh, check out the software, give it a try. What's the best spot? Yeah, go to koifin.com, create a free account, takes two seconds, um, start using the software. And if you like it, and we help you uh, analyze the market, um, track your investments, then upgrade to the to the paid version. Awesome. Uh, this has been a blast. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much. We've had a great time.